You guys want to thank Lauren for sharing that with us today. <clears throat> Boy, when you stop and think about it for a second, I mean, a five-minute walk from here, a five-minute walk, our neighbors, our neighbors are right over here from all around the world, the refugees right over here. And, you know, Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbors as yourself. So who's my neighbor? Well, the one you're sitting right next to right now, plus the ones right across the street. We just have a great chance to, uh, you know, celebrate Advent and tomorrow. So I plan on being there at least to see this on the inside a little bit. So maybe you can join me. <laughs> maybe not. You're probably saying, hey, preacher, <clears throat> you have no idea how busy we are. I mean, it's December. It's, what, December the 3rd? Oh, no, this, you only have 22 days. And let me, let me guess, your, your life is a mess. You've got more than you can get done. You, you don't know how you're going to get it done. And it's like everybody wants a piece of you, and you're tired of it already. And we just hit, hey, it's Advent Sunday. And so we, we don't want to lose focus what it's all about, because we all get the same crazy mess in our lives. Things are a mess, but we all have the same Savior, right? And, and this Advent Sunday, the focus is on hope, on hope. And so I, I picked uh, 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Can I see the verse real quick? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Uh, you're not going to make it through Christmas without Jesus Christ and your hope. You're not going to make it through your mess without Jesus Christ. And the mess might still stay there, might still stay there. But if you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, your Lord today and through this holiday, and then he's the blessed hope that's going to take you home, the blessed hope that's going to come for us, at least you'll survive your mess. You say, I, I don't want my life to be a mess. I don't want it to be a mess either, but it just is. You try to straighten it all out and get it in order, and this is what I'll do on this day, this day, this day, and you don't even get past today and be, somebody's messing up my life. It's upside down. It's, it's a mess. Have you ever thought that maybe that's designed by God? No, I want it to be in order, that everything has to go according to my plan. Your plan's probably wrong. Because God's going to take your life and your plan and whatever, and sometimes he just turns it upside down. You say, why would he do that? So that you might know your hope and other people watching you might get to know your hope as well. Because here's just the truth. It ain't just your life. Have you noticed everybody's life? The world? Let's just take the world. The world's a mess. It's upside down. Well, I can straighten it out. No, you can't. It's probably upside down for a reason. That people need to come to Christ. And that's why you're like, matter of fact, if I said it this way, <clears throat> have you ever thought that, you know, your puzzle is by God? You got all these pieces, you don't know where they go, and like a piece is missing, and you, you are actually, your life is a puzzle by God. You say, well, we just want the sermon. You're getting the sermon right now. This is part of it. Jesus is our hope, but you have a puzzle by God. You say, where'd you get that from? I'm, I'm just preaching through the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 5. And, and I noticed this one verse in the middle of the chapter with one word caught my attention. Puzzled by God. Look in your Bibles. And we'll, I'm just, we'll cover the context in a, me, in, in a minute. But I want to show you what's driving this sermon. It's in Acts chapter 5 and verse 24. Acts chapter 5. In verse 24, I, I really encourage you to get a seatback Bible, get your phone out, whatever you want to follow through. But follow with me. Look at Acts chapter 5 and verse, you guys there? You there? I got you interested a little bit. By the way, I don't want you to be interested in me. I want you to, to think of your mess, to think of all the stuff that's upside down. And you say, my life is not upside down. Everything's in order. Well, give it till tonight and something will go crazy with your life too. And, or you're just delusional because it is a mess. It is. Isn't God gracious? 
Well, pastor, my life wasn't a mess until you told me it's a mess, and now it's a mess. Watch what happens right in the middle of Acts chapter 5 and verse 24. Now, when the high priest, that would be Caiaphas, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests, when they heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. It's that, it's that word wondered right there. That one little word wondered. Now when I read that in the New King James, it sounds like they, they wondered that they wondered that they wondered. You know, the, the word wonder doesn't sound like that big a deal. Like, I wonder what you're going to have for lunch today. Do you wonder what I'm going to have for lunch? I mean, the, the word is like more like that. But that's not what that word is in the Greek. Matter of fact, I, I looked up that one word, wonder, in the Greek. Can I, can I see the Greek definition? Deporio. To be entirely at loss. To be entirely at loss. To be in perplexity. I, I would jump in there and say, to be upside down. You thought it was going to go like this, and it went, it went crazy. I'm, I'm so perplexed. I don't know what's going on. I'm at a loss. I, I don't know what to do. We had it all figured out. And then, what? Puzzled. Perplexed. At a loss. By God. Aren't you glad that's not the whole sermon? It should have your attention. It got my attention. That one word. Father, help us today. Just to be thankful that you're never perplexed. You're never upside down. You're never at a loss, ever, about anything. You are sovereign. But we have to admit, not just the Sanhedrin, not just the high priest, not these soldiers, but we feel the same way. We would understand where unbelievers, of course they should be perplexed. Unbelievers should, but we're believers. And we're perplexed. So I just pray the truth of this passage and even, Lord, the key to the passage would impact us whether we're saved or unsaved. But that when the service is over, whether you're online, on the radio, or in the room, we would all give our allegiance to Jesus. He's the only one that can make sense of it, even when it doesn't make sense to us. So he's our hope. Your only begotten son to us, Lord. He's our hope, and he's hope for today, not just when the rapture. He's hope for today. I pray, I pray. Remind us of that when we get to communion, when we celebrate the body and the blood of Jesus. We need it. I need it, Lord. I need it to remind me you are sovereign. I am saved. And yet still responsible for how I react and what I do in this work, this life, even this sermon. So bless us, Lord. We invite the presence of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that we have a Bible. We're just going to walk through our Bible and we'll be able to figure it out. And then, Lord, with your spirit and your son, that we could be victorious, even over a mess, I would pray. In the name of Jesus, and all of God's people would say. Amen. So Cindy and I were coming back from uh, Virginia after seeing our kids, and you know you're getting older. You know you're getting older when you start putting puzzles together. I mean, it's just like, you know, I used to do this, I used to do that, ride motorcycle. And then my mom, my mom started it because, you know, she stayed with us during COVID and she'd have a puzzle. And then I found myself, I'd go over there and start messing with it and kind of sitting down and an hour later, you know, think, hey, look what I've done. Look what I'm saying. So just kind of confessing to you, it, it, you don't have that yet. That's because you're young. When you get old, you'll... Matter of fact, Cindy and I, coming back, we stopped at Costco. 
I mean, I went puzzle shopping at Costco. Good price. <laughs> you know? Now, just in case, I, I got, I'm, I'm still a guy. The puzzle that I picked out for Cindy and I to put together is all cars and motorcycles and restored all, you know, Route 66, here we go. And it, it was a cool puzzle, you know, anyways. So, so we got the puzzle and we put it together in a dining room, you know, and it, it has to be there for, I don't know, 10 days, 14 days, and you sit down until <laughs> you can't sit there anymore. And fine. We got it all done. We got it all done. And there was one piece missing. And even Costco says, guaranteed, no piece is missing. There's one piece missing. Now, we don't have grandkids, a dog, or a cat, or anything. I mean, just me and Cindy. Did you lose the piece? No. <laughs> well, it's got to be here somewhere. So we look under the table, under the chairs, everywhere. We looked and looked and looked. We could not find that piece. And then finally, I took the picture, and I cut out a piece to put on the back of the puzzle. So that from a di and then Cindy, about 10 days later, she found the piece. Oh. You say, what's this got to do? Well, this is, this is your life. This is your life. And then you open up the box of your life and you look in there and say, what a mess, what a mess. Not even the same stuff. What is going on? And then people come along, whatever, schedules, and you just get frustrated. And, and to be really honest, you want to know your life? That's your life. Well, not my life. Well, let's talk for a while. You thought it was in order, and you can't even tell which piece to start with. And then you build it, you know, and then along comes other people, and they mess it up. They take away, and you think, what is going on with this? I just want, what if I told you all of that's designed by God? Now, I know we're supposed to do everything decently in order, so I'm not trying to mess it up more, but the reality is, the more you try to keep everything, the more things get messed up. And it might not even be somebody's fault. It was an accident. Cancer somehow came in. Somebody, you know, robbed our house and we weren't there. Their marriage is going kaput. I mean, there's, you got all this stuff that looks like that. I, I, I guess we should just quit. Hang it up. And that's why I, I don't blame the world. I really don't blame the world because that's all you got. Well, no wonder you drink. No wonder you shoot stuff in your own. No wonder you smoke those little cigarettes. No wonder you try to find somebody or something. They don't even know what sex they are anymore. No wonder because if that's it, how, how can I blame them? And then you come to Christ and you become a believer. And then you think, well, we'll have all the answers and we'll be the perfect example. And that kind of stuff still happens. Different categories. That's very general. But if you think you have it all together, hang on. It's a matter of time before it'll look like that. Well, here's how God answered my prayer last time. Well, last time might not be the next time. Have you noticed he doesn't answer the prayers the same way, even going through the book of Acts? We'll discover that. You cannot put God in a box, and he won't let you stay in a box. You say, why? So that others can see the gospel through you. Now, let me be clear. I'm a spoiled baby boomer. I don't want to mess. Don't mess with me. Don't take a piece of my puzzle. Don't. But it's a mess. So how did, how did we get here? Why, why did that word come up? Because you see, in the book of Acts, what we've discovered there on the Temple Mount, man, Peter's able to preach it. The Holy Spirit comes down. 3,000 people get saved. Everything predicted by the Lord came true the day of Pentecost. The church is on a roll. We've only been three or four months since Calvary. You talk about a mess with the Sanhedrin. You talk about the Christ rejectors and the Christ killers. They killed him. But God was faithful and used all of that story to redeem the ones that would say yes to Jesus. And he keeps going back and going back and going back to the ones who killed and rejected him. That's, that's the thing that's impacting my life this time going through the book of Acts. He did not give up on the ones that rejected him. And they keep going back to the Temple Mount, back to the Temple Mount, opportunity again with the gospel. And the church gets birthed, 3,000. 
saved and baptized. And the church starts to go forward. Then the lame guy that's been lame for 40 years, he gets healed. And he's dancing on top of the temple. And people are getting saved. And then finally the Sanhedrin comes down. And they, they put John and Peter under arrest. You're, you're in trouble. Quit teaching and preaching in that name. Stop it. We got, we, we got to. And then more people get saved. That's what's happened in the book of Acts. What you have, though, is the church, the church with 5,000 people, the church has this foundation. They know Jesus Christ. Christ has saved them right there out of Israel, right there in the temple. He saved them. And they've got this foundation. I want to pick up our context where we were. Look at chapter 4. The, the foundation that's true for the church before you get to this puzzle. Chapter 4 and verse 33, just looking at the foundation, we saw this a few weeks ago. With great power, can I hear you say great power? Great power. Okay, that word for great is mega in the Greek. For power, it's dunamis. It's with mega dynamite. And it's not like, you know, firecracker going off. This is nuclear. This is nuclear. The church, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They were told to stop it, but they have mega power. They prayed for boldness, and they've got boldness. I don't know about you, but I want mega power. I'll, I'll take the power, but mega power, mega, I just like that. I wonder if they make a puzzle, mega power puzzle. I don't, I don't know. I kind of doubt it. But anyways, mega power. And then notice the church, it also has great grace. Can I hear you say great grace? Great grace. Same, same verse. They got great power, great grace was upon them all. Now, now listen, that's the only time in the Bible it uses mega with grace. We should pay attention to that. You've got grace upon grace. We've got grace all the way through. But you don't have mega grace except that verse. So I want to look at that verse and figure out, okay, they have great power. They have great grace. And if you understand who they're preaching to, they're on that spot, on planet Earth, in the middle of Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, with the ones that hated Christ. You better have great grace. Because God is great, mega, with the ones who killed his son. The 5,000 that got saved had rejected Jesus. If I was God, I'd burn them. Be glad I'm not God. His grace upon grace, mega grace in this church. So you got mega power and mega grace. And before long, I mean, they don't have buildings. They're meeting in Solomon's porch. Thousands of them. They started realizing everybody doesn't have a place to live or stay or food. So they started selling their stuff and giving it away and making sure everybody was taken care of. What's going on? Mega power, mega grace. And then you've got these ones that you, you got Barney. Remember we saw Barney with the nickname, Mr. Encouragement. His name was Joseph. But man, he was down and he sold some property and brought it and helped out. And they, they called him Barnabas. That was his nickname. And then you've got your first major problem. Acts chapter 5. You have some wannabes, the great pretenders, Ananias and Sapphira. They're pretending to be Barnabas. So the church is on a roll. Great power, great grace. But now you've got these great pretenders, and they think, well, hey, we'll sell the property, but we're only going to give half, but we're going to pretend that we're giving it all for the Lord. By the way, don't be a great pretender. Just be honest with who you are and be honest with people around you. Because once you start pretending to be somebody else, Jesus called that being a hypocrite. When you walk into church doing that, at least this church with great power and great grace. Two weeks ago, I told you, it's a killer sermon, killer sermon. It was a killer sermon. Because Ananias, thinking he could walk in and act like Barney. And, and Peter said to Ananias, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? It's right there in chapter 5. By the way, I don't know about you, but that made me do a heart check. When's the last time you actually sat down and asked the question, has Satan filled my heart? Has the father of lies lied to me? And I believed it to where now he's controlling me and not the Holy Spirit. It happened to Ananias. It happened to Sapphira. They were Holy Spirit-filled people in chapter 4. They're satanically filled people in chapter 5. And you think you're better than them? You, you know what that'll do when you have a guy drop dead in church? 
holy fear, great fear. You see, the foundation of this church was great power, great grace, and great fear. I'm not making it up. That's what it says. Look at chapter 5. Chapter 5. It's all a part of chapter 4. Verse 5. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last. So great fear. Can I hear say great fear? Came upon all those who heard these things. His wife, Anna, uh, Sapphira, she wasn't there. She comes back three hours later. You know where she was, right? She was buying stuff on Amazon with all the extra money. <laughs> she didn't know her hubby was dead. He's dead. He's buried. Boy, that, that'll make going to church a little bit different, huh? Where's my husband at? Ne- never mind. Okay. Just seeing if you're paying attention. Verse 11, so great fear. There it is twice. Can I hear you say great fear? Great fear. That's because Sapphira died. Came upon all the church, upon all who heard these things. So here, here's the foundation for this church. Great power. They got Jesus as their Savior, but they have great power with the Holy Spirit. They have great grace by God. And they have great fear and great fear. Knowing that God can take you out early. Ananias and Sapphira did not lose their salvation. They just went to heaven pretty quick. God took them out. When you realize, you know, going to church and doing things and joining in, God takes it serious. Why, why does he? He gave his son, his body and his blood of his son for that. He doesn't need pretenders. In case you are a pretender, just get converted or repent. In case you got something in your heart that shouldn't be there, repent. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. We're, we got communion. We got communion. And this is a great church, almost perfect. It's not perfect, almost perfect. Great power, great grace, great fear, great fear. When you have that in line, look out. Because that kind of church is going to grow. A pure church. A holy church, a church that's in love with Jesus and doing what they should be doing. You say, why? Well, now we pick up our context. That's the background. Remember, we're going to the puzzle, but to get to the puzzle, you got to get to verse 12. So chapter 5, book of Acts, verse 12. Solving the puzzle, this is continuing power, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, uh, all 12 of them, through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done amongst the people. And they were all with... They were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. They're still on the Temple Mount. There's over 5,000 of them now. And, and now the signs and the wonders, the miracles are happening. Why? Because you have great power, great grace, and great fear. Great, you have a pure church. You have a pure church. So now there's stuff happening, signs and wonders, miracles, healings. All that's happening through the apostles. And you say, why? That's what they prayed for in chapter 4. They actually prayed for that in chapter 4. Guess what? It's now happening in chapter 5. Uh, a little bit of commercial. I'm not, I don't know what you're praying about for your church in 2024. I'm hoping Jesus comes back. But if he doesn't come back, I'm all down, Lord, for whatever you want to do. Whatever miracle, whatever wonder, whatever sign, we're going to preach your word. And I hope it's in great power, in great grace, with great fear, great fear. Amen. You say, I don't want that kind of church. Well, I'll pray you find one that you want that. I want this. Almost perfect. It's not perfect. It's almost perfect. And God purified it. God purified it. And so it's continuing. It's continuing in the power. Answered prayer. But then multitudes are are added. Verse 13. Yet none of the rest, they're on the Temple Mount, yet none of the rest, a lot of people, thousands, none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them greatly. Or highly, excuse me. Verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. So there's some people saying, I don't know if we want to join that place. I'm not sure. Why? Because you might die. But then there's others. Multitudes are joining, are added to the Lord. We're increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes. Can I hear you say multitudes? Multitudes. Don't you like that word? Multitudes of both men and women. Now, I'm all down. I'm down for when God adds to the church, but when he multiplies the church, oh, whoa, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's kind of like when, if you're saving and all of a sudden you get multiple added to the saving, whoa, wait a minute, wait. Multiplication is kind of a cool deal. How did we get to where God is multiplying with multitudes? Great power, great grace, 
great fear, great fear. And what they prayed is answered. Then you got people going like, I don't know if I want to go to Grace Church, man. They take it so serious. Uh Uh-huh. And God keeps adding and adding and adding. And I I can't tell you, but, oh, maybe I can't tell you. No, I can't tell you. If we get to January, I, I, I think I know what God might be wanting to do with our church in 2024, but check with me in January. And, and until then, uh, can I see the quote by Corson? Corson, on this thought, pay attention. Although the church was no longer the in place to hang out for anyone and everyone, those who had truly been touched by the Lord said, this is where I need to be, in the place of power and purity. Even if it's painful, even if I'm smitten, even if I'm uncomfortable from time to time, this is where I'll stay. The book of Acts illustrates how intimately purity and power, purity and power are linked together. Many times we sing more love, more power, when in reality, Our need is less sin and less carnality. A wise and loving father, knowing the results of the misuse of power, will not give it to those who are not pure. Did I tell you we're having communion today? Chance to do a heart check? Because this puzzle is for unbelievers, it'll never make sense. But it's also for believers. Like, what is God doing in my life? Well, the church, wow, this early church is almost perfect. It's on the grow, multitudes added. But then you have multitudes healed, verse 15. So they brought the sick out into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter, the shadow of Peter, passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude, can I hear you say multitude, gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Something's going crazy. I mean, we were there at the Holy Mountain, Solomon's porch, and then all of a sudden people started thinking, well, hey, if I get my grandfather or my uncle or I get my cousin or my brother and they're kind of sick and just get them out on the street and maybe if Peter just passes by in his shadow, just maybe, maybe, maybe that'll, that'll work. And then people from other towns, Pampa and Borger, San Angelo. Where's San Angelo? There we go. San, San Angelo, well, maybe, maybe if, just get relatives out there and put them down and throw them out there. And then, and then there's a shadow of, of Peter and you say, what is that? That's nuts. Are you telling me, are you telling me that that Peter, that there's such a purity there, there's such a a reverence there, there's such a holiness, there's such great power and great grace and great fear that just the shadow of an apostle? Can, Can I remind you who wrote the book of Acts? Can I remind you of Dr. Luke, who's a scientist, who investigated every story thoroughly? Can I remind you of the Gospel of Luke and now the book of Acts? This isn't just somebody that was a fisherman. This is an educated scientist, a doctor. The the language that Luke wrote in the Acts in Luke, I mean, it was so eloquent at times. I mean, he knew what he was writing. Can I see Lesor real quick, the quote? From what we know of physicians, even in those days, we cannot assume that Luke would gullibly accept stories of miraculous healing without investigating them. I'm telling you, it's like off the chart. Well, explain that, Pastor Bill. I can't explain it. I don't even want to. It it ain't the shadow. It ain't the, the cloth that the woman that came and touched the hem of his garment it ain't, it's not the handkerchief of, of Paul. It, it's they're, they're putting faith in something they can touch or see. It, the healing all comes from Jesus. It's always by faith. But the mechanisms, well, they can vary. I, I'm just telling you, this, this church is hooked up. 
Man, they're bringing people, the shadow of Peter, like, wow. The, the Holy Mount, I mean, it's going crazy. Thousands of people told not to teach or preach. They're going to teach and preach in the name anyway. We got it. We got it. We got no choice. And that's where the book of Acts ends, and everybody had a nice day. Well, it should end there. I mean, you don't get better than that. Well, that's just going to make somebody else mad. Well, who could get mad at that? The ones that killed Jesus. The ones that have tried to stop this whole church thing. Rumors of a resurrection. People getting healed. They're going to get really mad. You need to know the world gets really mad. When we point to the only answer is Jesus. You have a problem in your life, the answer is always Jesus. The world gets really mad. And if you're a religious leader in the world, and you're kind of, you know, you need your offerings, you need people, you need to have, they get really mad. Really mad. So the church is doing great. I mean, I, I love it, I love it. But then we get to indignation. Verse 17. Then the, the high priest, that's Caiaphas. That's the same Caiaphas that killed Jesus, okay? That was three, four months ago. Now we're dealing with this. Then the high priest rose up, and all of those who were with him, that would be the Sanhedrin, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. They should be filled with awe. They should be filled with questions. They should be filled with, what, what's happening? That guy never was able to walk or leap. No, they're filled with indignation. Can I hear you say indignation? You do not want that fill in your cup. You don't. Man, they're really mad. They were filled with indignation. The other word for that same word is jealousy. They're filled with jealousy. They laid their hands on the apostles, not just Peter and John. They laid their hands. They grabbed them, all 12 apostles, and they put them in a common prison. Well, hey, wait. People are getting healed. People are giving hope. People are getting saved. Why are, you, why are you so mad? Or jealous? It goes all the way back to John the Baptist. It's out there at the Jordan River and all the people are leaving our synagogues and our temple and they're going out there. That crazy guy, biker in the desert and he doesn't even know what he's saying. He's preparing the way for Christ. And Jesus shows up. Boy, then they get jealous of him. Like saying, you know, he's in trouble. Why is he in trouble? The, the thing got him in trouble more than anything is with Lazarus come forth. Oh man, that just blew the box up. Can't have that. We cannot have resurrection. We cannot have resurrection. Why? Because we don't believe it. <laughs> you need to change your beliefs. I've told you about the Sadducees. There they are again. Can I see an Acts? Acts 23. So that you know I'm not making this up. Acts 23 says, For Sadducees say, they actually say, there is no resurrection. Well, don't say that to Lazarus. Don't say that to Jesus. But they actually say, there is no resurrection. These are the religious leaders. And there's no angel. There's no spirit. There's no afterlife. Why, why would you go to a religion like that? Why would you be a, a Sadducee? And a religion? I mean, you don't believe in angels. You don't believe in afterlife. You don't believe in resurrection. Do you believe in heaven? Why, why, why would you even do it? Now, the Pharisees, they do believe that. But the Sadducees, and that's what's being pointed out to us in Acts. That's why they're sad, you see. <laughs> Only they're not sad, you see. They're mad, you see. They're mad. Why are you so mad? We told you to stop teaching in his name and the resurrection and all this stuff. Now everybody's getting healed and we're jealous. I would say get over it and come to Jesus. Leave your religious whatever and come to Jesus. Be a part of the deal. Never! And here's the amazing part. Great grace, great grace. 
understands when this puzzle goes crazy that the heart of God still wants to save them. You have to put that in your formula. They killed Christ. They said, don't preach in his name. We don't believe in the resurrection. And they have witness after witness after witness. And God still wants them to witness more. That should actually encourage you. Because, you know, I, I, I give somebody like, like two or three shots at it. And after that, I'm cutting them. And God says, no, I'll go back and back and back and back. So these guys running the whole show in Jerusalem on the Holy Mount. They go out and they grab them, all 12. Last time it was Peter and John, but they grab them. And they throw them into the prison. Hmm. I wonder what they talked about in jail. There's 12. Now, Peter and John had already been in jail. So the other ten are saying, what happens next? What do we do now? And Peter and John said, well, last time this would happen, but this is a new time. I know what's going to happen. Maybe we should pray. Maybe we should sing a song. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, but hear me, hear me. Those 12 guys, they were hooked up in church, the whole thing, and now they're in jail. See, their puzzle just got messed up. Are you tracking with me? And if you think the puzzle always comes out the same way, it doesn't. It doesn't. One story to another, it's a different ending. God knows how to design your puzzle for today, unbeliever or believer. So their puzzle just got messed up. Verse 19, they're in prison, but at night, we don't know what time, but at night, it's dark, an angel. Can I hear you say angel? angel. Now, see, what I love about that, the Sadducees don't believe in angels. <laughs> So God's going to use an angel. It doesn't say Michael or Gabriel. It doesn't say archangel. Now, those are the really big ones, okay? It just says an angel. Now, you need to know there's lots in, of angels. And I'm not t trying to disc an angel, but you have your, like your ordinary angels. Like Joe Bob the angel. Joe Bob the angel. You know? Now, I'm not diminishing him, but he ain't Michael. He's not Gabriel, okay? So I think it's, it just says an angel. It's an angel of the Lord. Open the prison door. Now, there's guards there. There's locks there. They're, they're locked up. They're going to court in the morning with the Sanhedrin. Not a problem for an angel, even Joe Bob the angel. No problem. Just pick the lock. Hey, you guys want to get out of here? <laughs> and the angel brought them out. Way to go. And then the angel said, go stand in the temple. Say what? No, go back to where you were. Go stand in the temple. Speak to the people all the words of this life. Now, wait a minute, Joe Bob, angel. Don't, don't you know that every time we go up there, we get arrested. They're mad at us. They're jealous. You want us to go back where we got in trouble? Uh-huh. When do you want us? First thing you can, go back. Should we just hold hands and sing? No, we, you need to speak. All 12 of you need to speak the wonderful words of life. What are the wonderful words of life? Jesus. Tell everybody what it's like to live with Jesus. Tell, tell them about Jesus. Just You go back up there. Well, now, wait, wait. Are you sure we don't go back to Galilee? You know, we got a safe place in Galilee. The Dead Sea, we could go and hang out in some caves at the Dead Sea. You're, you're telling us to go back to the Holy Mount, where this whole thing started. Uh-huh. See, you have a problem with your puzzle. Because if you're like me, you're trying to think, I need a safe place, I need to get away. And God often says, no, you need to go back and just be a witness. When? Uh, sign up would be a good time. And so they did. Spurgeon says it like this on that section. The angel of the Lord opened the prison door. That's true. Set free the preachers. Yes. But might not be the preacher himself. He might give the ministers their charge, but the angel had no charge to preach himself. Why does God set you free from your prison? So that you can represent him, that you can be obedient, that you can speak the wonderful things of life to the people who have, still have a puzzle that's all messed up. You tracking with me? It's like God says, okay, got you out. They'll go back to what you were doing. But they think we're, it don't matter what they think. You go back and do what I want you to do. And so... Here's another key to the story. Verse 21, when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. Immediate obedience. 
They didn't say, hey, we need to swing by Starbucks for a while and get some donuts and think about this. Maybe we'll show up around 10, maybe 12, you know, let everybody kind of get in the mood a little bit, you know. <laughs> okay, Mr. Angel Joe Bob, you got us out of jail. Do you want us to write him a note? No, no, just go back up and start preaching. Okay. And they did it. Immediate obedience. I, I don't know what the Holy Spirit's going to tell you today. I don't know what part of this sermon is for you. I don't know. I don't know what your puzzle looks like, but I can tell you this. When he tells you to do something, immediate obedience is always the best. Well, I, I think I'll think about that. Don't think about it. Immediate obedience to what God is telling you to do. Because you procrastinate, you'll talk yourself out of it. You'll just keep eating the donuts and drinking the coffee, and you'll never get done what God wants you to do. And for some, it might be it's your turn to turn your life over to Christ. You've been saying no way too many times, but he's so gracious over and over and over again. For others, it might be, I'm tired of that mess. I don't want to go back to the mess. I'm done with the mess. God might say, you need to go back and do what I've told you to do in the middle of the mess. Immediate obedience by Joe Bob to the disciples. Puzzled by God. Puzzled by God. But the high priest, Caiaphas, and those with him came, and they called the council together, 70 members of the Sanhedrin. They called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel. And they sent to the prison to have them brought. Go get the 12. See, they don't know. They're not at their aim. Anyways, that's where it gets kind of fun. Verse 22. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison door shut securely. The guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when Caiaphas, the high priest, and the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered. They were perplexed. They were entirely at a loss what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, look, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. Sound familiar? We checked, there's nobody home. We don't know what happened. The tomb is empty. That same group of men, that same place, three, four months earlier, it's empty. What are we going to do? Oh, there's disciples hold a grave in the body. You know, he's got, got to spread that around. We can't have a resurrection. We still can't get over Lazarus. What are we going to do with it? No, no more Jesus. No more. Put him on trial. They ain't there. <laughs> and that's where I, I got to look at Caiaphas. I got to look at the temple guard. I got to look at all these guys sitting on their bench with all their robes on, thinking we're mighty. And they're perplexed, they're at a loss. It's like somebody just dumped the whole thing right in their lap and they don't have a clue what to do. What's going on? Hey, they're up on the Temple Mount <laughs> preaching Jesus again. I actually think it's kind of funny. God has a sense of humor. You know, it, I'm not making light of the story, I'm just saying, like, peekaboo. 
get a life, guys. Who's in charge? It ain't you. So they go get him. They don't grab him this time because, you know, they, somebody's opening doors somewhere. Houdini somehow, whatever. No. And they get him down in that courtroom. And we saw a picture a few weeks ago. I mean, that's an official. I mean, it's like being in the Congress building. I mean, there it is. Everybody's in their royal seats. And there stands 12 guys. And all they're doing is talking about Jesus. And man, they are so mad. Especially Caiaphas. It's like that story of Lazarus, that story of Jesus, and the story never goes away. And you guys are messing it up. And I don't know how you got out, but now you're in big trouble. So here's the accusation. Verse 27. When they brought them, the 12 disciples, the apostles, when they brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? He won't say Jesus. Didn't we strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you've filled Jerusalem with your teaching, your doctrine. And you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Yes, we do. See, when Caiaphas says that, he said, you're trying to make us feel guilty, like somehow we murdered Christ. Well, you did. But I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. You, you need the blood of Jesus on you. you. You already have the blood of Jesus on you because you're guilty. But we want to put the blood of Jesus on you so you can be forgiven and saved. See, the key to the puzzle is the blood of Jesus. It is. It's absolutely the blood of Jesus. And so you're trying to stick it to us with the blood. Well, you already stuck yourself. Can I see Matthew? Remember what they said? And all the, and all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Well, guess what? It is. You're guilty. All of us are guilty. He died for our sin, for your sin. In that sense, the blood of Jesus is already on you. Oh, but then there's this other. We intend to get the blood of Jesus, the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. We want the blood of Jesus to give you forgiveness and freedom and that your puzzle will finally, maybe you won't get it all together, but you'll know that the key piece, the key piece to the whole thing is the blood of Jesus. God's only begotten son. Now, if you lose that piece, you, 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 you got no hope. No hope. Well, just fix my puzzle. Stay focused on that centerpiece, the blood of his son. You weren't bought with bulls or goats or golden. You were bought with the blood of Jesus. Can I see First Peter? First Peter, knowing that you were not redeemed, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold or your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers. No, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Don't ever forget, don't ever forget, that's your redemption. And you're accountable for his death. He died for your sins. Oh, but the blood of Jesus on me is my only hope. That's salvation. If you never receive Christ, you're not saved. You're still guilty for rejecting him Oh, but you never took the redemption, the blood of Jesus. You say, but I am saved. You still need the blood. You still need the blood. No, I got saved. I don't need the blood anymore. You got saved. Now your problem is sin. Ananias and Sapphira had a sin problem. They needed the blood. And you say, well, where'd you get that from? First John. Can I see First John? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. Well, you intend for this man's blood to be on us. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Guzik says it like this. Can I see Guzik? 
The high priest no doubt meant that the apostles intended to hold the Jewish leaders responsible, and they were, in some measure, for the execution of Jesus. Yet, we know that the apostles must have desired for the high priest, Caiaphas himself, and the other Jewish leaders to come to faith in Jesus, even as some of the other priests did. For certain, the apostles wanted to bring the covering, cleansing blood of Jesus upon the high priest and others in the council. You see, sometimes God just messes up the puzzle to get you in a place where you get to represent the gospel before people that hate you. You say, well, how do you know that's the right interpretation? Because I read the rest of the paragraph. <laughs> we'll pick it up next week, but I got to show you. Notice, notice what he says. Look, you've filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and tend to bring this man's blood upon us. Peter says, verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior to give repentance to Israel, forgiveness of sins. We are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. You need the blood of Jesus on you, Caiaphas. You need the blood of Jesus on you, Sadducees. You need the blood of Jesus on you, Pharisees. You need to receive Jesus and his blood. This would be a good place to have communion. Don't ever take that for granted. You know, I, I know there's churches, at least I've been told, they, they don't want to talk about the blood. They don't want any blood songs. They don't want blood verses. We proclaim the blood of Jesus that God would become a man, the God-man, so in a body he could die. God can't die without becoming a man. And so he took on humanity, 100%, the God-man, so he could die. That he could bleed out the sinless, spotless, perfect lamb, your substitute, my substitute, the perfect substitute, the only one, that by his blood, my sins, your sins are forgiven. But there's a difference between like agreeing with that and receiving it. Receiving it. Where you finally say the big yes and all the things to where I'm, okay, I'm just going to trust, I'm going to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard about it my whole life, but then the puzzle happened to me and my life went upside down in many different ways for like three months. All crazy, crazy. 16 years old. Then there came a moment in time underneath the motorcycle where I had to decide yes or no. Yes or no. I said yes. And it's been a ride ever since. If you're there, please say yes. If you've already said yes, well, then we still need the blood. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for communion. Thank you that we can focus on your son. We have a tendency to look at the puzzle. We look at the circumstances in our lives. And, but yet the center of all of it is the blood of your son. So even with all the other pieces, Lord, up in the air, at least we'll get that one right. We want the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins. We want the blood of Jesus to be received afresh and anew in our lives today. We want the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all sin. We want the blood. And maybe you're here today and you've never actually received him. You've never said yes to him. You've heard about it. You probably had communion, but you've never said yes to Jesus when he knocks on the door of your heart. 
You put it off. You procrastinate it. But I, I would just encourage you with immediate obedience that when Jesus knocks, you want to open that door. You want to say yes. Like even right now. So I don't know who's in the room. I don't know who's watching on YouTube or on the radio listening, but man, if it's you, that you know right now God's knocking. Jesus is calling you by name and you need to say yes. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you're in this room, I'm going to ask you to stand as you receive Christ as your Savior. We're just going to pray for you and encourage you. That's all we're going to do. And then we're going to celebrate his table. Is there anybody in this room that's just by standing? You're saying, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying yes to the blood. I'm saying yes to Jesus as my Savior today. Is there anybody? Thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. Anybody else? Thank you, buddy. Thank you. All the way from San Angelo. Father, thank you for the ones that would stand. I know that that causes a excitement in heaven, a rejoicing in heaven when we say yes to Jesus. So save these your people, Lord. Save us, I pray. But we also thank you, Lord, that we can do a deep dive into our own heart. I pray that we'd be careful, Lord, we'd examine our heart make sure it really is the Holy Spirit that we're not listening to the father of lies or Satan or the devil that we're right with you if there's anything Lord we need to confess now would be a great time to do that we just come claiming the blood of Jesus for the sweet fellowship we should have with you thank you for church today thank you for this table ask your blessings on us Lord as we seek to honor Jesus it's in his name we'd ask. All of God's people would say. Hey, as we pass out the elements, um, we're going to ask you to just hold on to them till all of us can partake together. Could I have you guys stand with me? Jesus said, take eat. This is my body. My body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of the bread, drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Father, we thank you for this reminder. We thank you for the illustration. We thank you for the perfect picture the body of the Lord Jesus, that God became a man so that the God-man could die. We thank you for your body, Lord Jesus, and that you were our substitute. How we thank you for the blood, the new covenant, Lord, in this little cup as it represents the very blood as Jesus bled out for us. We rejoice in that, the forgiveness of our sins, the cleansing, Lord, of our bodies. We thank you for the body and the blood of Jesus. Help us, Lord, as we go back to our puzzles that scattered across <laughs> the floor in different arenas. Help us to go back with the, the key piece of everything, the very blood of Jesus. Use us, Lord, I pray, for your glory. And all of God's people would say, enjoy your Lord. Enjoy him.